Jack. Levi. The Book Club from Hell. Hi everybody, it's Levi. Just before we jump into the intro for the episode, I'd like to thank everybody who's been listening, especially any repeat listeners. Last month, Jack and I broke 400 downloads for the entire month on podcasting alone. That's not including YouTube. If you're enjoying the content that we're creating and you feel like we're getting better, <laughs> which we, we hope we are, you can follow us on Twitter at bookclubhell666. You can reach out to us there if you have any suggestions about books that you would like us to read. With that out of the way, please enjoy the episode. Iconoclast, provocateur, firebrand. All these words are certainly appropriate descriptors for the former Breitbart contributor, Mike Ma. In his first book, Harassment Architecture, outspoken accelerationist Ma uses the internal monologue of his unnamed protagonist to lambast everything the author presumably hates about the sterile and impotent existence of American life. If you find racism, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, or misanthropy offensive, you should definitely read this book. You'll hate it. Mr. Ma hunts down every politically correct sacred cow he can find, slices its throat, eats its flesh raw, and does a naked workout on its remains. The book is unapologetically obscene, offensive, hateful, and violent. However, if you can stomach the chaotic stream of consciousness and in-your-face offensiveness, the book also poses some interesting questions about the contradictions of life in modern industrialized society. Compared to almost all of our previous books, we found harassment architecture refreshingly well-written and even worthwhile. We may even read Mike Maher's second book, Gothic Violence. But for now, please enjoy the Book Club from Hell's discussion about harassment architecture by Mr. Mike Ma. I found harassment architecture when I was looking around on the 4chan literature boards because yep. I use those boards to find the sorts of books that we look at on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, nice. Because lit is just a total dumpster fire. So you, you're, you're guaranteed to find something awful yep. to read there. Yep. So found this book there. The consensus seemed to be that it had no plot. And... <laughs> And was was hard to follow, and this this is by lit standards, so you know it's probably going to be fairly incoherent. If people on lit say that it's tough yeah. to follow, yeah, I did notice that it was pretty short. That was I've, a benefit <laughs> for this podcast. I have a very strong preference for short books. <laughs> yeah, after Evola, <laughs> yeah. and then I I was a bit more interested after I looked into Mike Ma. He he had a storied Vine career. Yeah. And oh, then, really? I didn't see his. I didn't see his Vine stuff. His what? Vine stuff is more or less he got the same. Off Twitter, yeah. didn't he? It's just the same as his YouTube stuff, except yeah. shorter. Yeah. I also looked at his YouTube <laughs> stuff. He has a new book coming out. Or yeah. no, it's already out. Yeah. Gothic violence. Gothic violence just released. I like the front cover of Gothic violence, so that made me feel a bit more optimistic. Yeah. About harassment architecture. What did I think going in? I thought that it looked strange, <laughs> <laughs> but I am. In the middle of my university semester, and I had an extremely strong preference for anything that would not have too high a cognitive overhead. I think we had lined up either Petty Linkler or, <laughs> yeah, we, or Alexander Dugan. No, we neither were, of them we, were easy. We so. were going to do Dugan, and I was just like, "There's no way that I yeah. can read Dugan right now. <laughs> <laughs> I need, I need to focus on my studies." Yeah, so I, I thought it just looked strange, and in the, in, in the front cover or in the first few pages he gives a shout out to several people one of whom is bap which we assumed meant bronze age perverts and given that bronze age pervert has been so good to us in terms of <laughs> in terms of our views and also he is just an interesting person to read we thought that uh, well i thought that this would be a good a good uh, f kind of follow up in the same vein or in the same no, it's not really the same genre, but it's the same... Mm. Not the same genre, but definitely the same intellectual tradition. Yes, intellectual as tradition. Mr. Pervert. And, and same... And same... They, sim similar audience. They talk about many similar things. Yes. Yeah. They have a similar style that seems, despite the fact that Bronze Age Pervert says he doesn't understand irony or sarcasm, <laughs> they both have styles that are absolutely dripping in irony and sarcasm. <laughs> They both talking talk about the need to worship the sun, get tanned, get shredded, go to the gym. So, what what is the 
30,000 foot view of this book. So, it's supposed to be fiction. Whether or not it is fiction, I'm not entirely sure. But it is a stream of consciousness of a person, presumably either Mike Ma himself or definitely somebody (laughs) strongly based on Mike Ma. Yeah, unnamed protagonist. Well, did you find their name? No, unnamed I'm pretty sure it's unnamed. It's all in first person. It's largely stream of consciousness and it's essentially a collection of probably a hundred little segments ranging from a sentence to a few pages in length each. And it'll, they'll loosely be about like, oh, I had this dream and this thing happened in the dream or I was at a bar and I started daydreaming about shooting somebody and then some girl interrupted me and I was rude to her and walked out or rants about the <laughs> degeneration of modern society. So, yeah, it's not clear to me whether it's fiction or whether it's just Mike Mars personal reflections but i could i could see it being interpreted as fiction yeah i think it's it's at least dressed up as fiction yes all it it has no plot that i can discern at the very end there was there was some sort of hint at a plot where yeah maybe he was preparing people to overthrow the current world order but i'm not sure if that was a daydream or not i don't Yeah, it's hard to say. So the way that I put it is that uh, Mike Ma is the poor man's Brett Easton Ellis. So this was extremely reminiscent of... Like, some of the parts, it sounded like he was basically channeling Patrick Bateman for some of the the dialogue. The bits (laughs) where he's describing the the specific brands and models of the clothes that he or other people are wearing... There's seem seem to be there. imitating American Psycho, but... You're strongly imitated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was less torturous than American Psycho, which I appreciated. The scenes tend to be Mike Ma or not Mike Ma, the not Mike Ma who is the protagonist of this book. Yes. Unnamed will, protagonist. Will go to a place... It's sort of like in Thus Spake Zarathustra by nature. Mm. Zarathustra will go somewhere, start talking to... Yeah. A group of people or some animals in a forest or something give them philosophical insights or yeah. think philosophical insights while observing them and then we'll just go somewhere else and repeat the process. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. It's, except um, except it, it's really, really, really cynical <laughs> <laughs> and really pessimistic, much more so than Thus Spake Zarathustra. Yeah, or you could think about it as maybe Bronze Age mindset with some sort of narrative device framing it. Whereas Bronze Age mm. mindset was was just, just well this is this is what I think. Here Mike Ma will have the character or the main character go somewhere, be irritated by a woman or see a fat person, and that will make them slip into their liquid daydream and start thinking about why the world is so degenerate. I think that what I found interesting was that I, I went and looked at Mike Ma's YouTube channel after I read the book. Mm-hmm. And I was quite surprised that he didn't... Like, he's a strange guy, but he didn't come off as creepy or as psychopathic as I thought he... <laughs> him, I was expecting a kind of El- Elliot Rogers level <laughs> weirdness. But he's he's clearly a bit strange, but he seemed like he just hangs out with his friends got a strange sense of humor likes to troll people yeah he seemed to me to me it was sort of expected i had a feeling he'd be kind of like this bright but yeah <laughs> bright but kind of guy he, he is a journalist for yeah. bright but yeah it's, oh is he yeah it's yeah, that right. sort of bright has he, written, has he does he write for them yeah Apparently. yeah right he's oh maybe we should read some of his other it's stuff. that bright but kind of scene of yes, americans under 30 Super sarcastic, super ironic. Yeah. It can get a bit tiring after a while, just the, the constant irony. Yeah. You think, um, yeah. I've kind of heard this before. Yeah. I did see one of his videos, he was playing, I think it's Satanic Rites of Drugula by Electric Wizard on guitar. <laughs> I did appreciate that. That was good. I think Big he's, bonus he's points. actually uh, not a bad musician. Amateur musician. 
So, Jack, what did you... Like, what were some of the main things that... Or tell, start us off with, like, one thing that you, that you liked about him. Something I liked. Yep. He writes well. It's not... This is not... He writes well for the things we look at for this podcast. He he just writes well. He's he's funny. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good writer. He's he's actually a good writer. And reading this did make me want to read Gothic Violence. Yeah. His next yeah. book. So <laughs> I just that, similar, like, take, maybe, take, take from that. Maybe we will. could read Gothic Violence at some point as a follow up for the for the show. I I hope if he's improved his writing and if it has more structure than this, that Gothic Violet might be more enjoyable. Yeah, I would agree. I think he's a fairly good writer. Yeah. Good writer. Kept his book short. I've already said that I liked that it was only <laughs> like, 150 pages like or so. Books, but yes. <laughs> I really like it when I don't have to read too much for these episodes. <laughs> I liked that a lot. I suppose there there are some intersections between what I believe and what what he's espousing in this book, or what I what I assume he's espousing. I'm not sure how much of a disconnect there is between Mike Ma, the author, and whatever character is the protagonist in this book, if that is representative of Mike Ma or not. Mm. But the the main character in the book will complain that people don't exercise enough. So, I don't disagree with that. Yeah. That's something. Most people don't exercise enough. Most people eat pretty poorly, so he attacks. Oh, he's got that thing about seed oils and... Yeah, and uh, Applebee's or whatever. It is the chain food in, uh, in the US. I had to look up what Applebee's was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what that was. Yeah, so, it's again, similar to Bronze Age Pervert kind of advocating in their perspective a clean healthy way of living mm. so like oh he also really likes the outdoors so those are all very wholesome good things i think <laughs> but the, it's it's also like drenched in in hatred there is, oh, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's baggage yeah he, he can't just say oh yeah it's good to uh you know eat eat i don't know Whatever he like, what's his diet? Mm. Sort of carnivore, paleo. I think you know to eat raw milk. He's all about raw milk products. And that that's fine. But then he also mixes it with. Oh, I saw this family eating at Applebee's or something, and they're basically feeding themselves poison. They're feeding their kids poison, and the dad's a piece of shit for taking them there. <laughs> that's a piece of shit for taking them there, and for dressing nicely, and for dressing nicely at Applebee's to go to yeah. Applebee's. <laughs> so the, the part of his contention that our diet on the whole is shit. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think yeah. standard Australian diet, garbage, similar to the standard American diet, is absolute garbage. Yeah, it's it's, it's uh, terrible for you. Probably not as bad as the standard American diet, but it's still pretty bad. Yeah, I don't, yeah. <laughs> it's bad for you. It makes you tired. Makes you fat. It makes you fat and tired and weak and yeah. sloppy. And the thing punchy. is, here he ascribes it to a conspiracy. So it's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it is conspiracy. It's not, it's not as just well, these are yeah. these are foods that are very cheap to manufacture that yeah. are addictive. Yeah, and that's why companies make them. So basically, if you didn't if you didn't seek out this shit, they wouldn't give it to you. They wouldn't try to sell it to you. Yes. In his view, it's I don't know the Jews or Asians or just yeah. He didn't really capital he, T he really capital T they, them. They, they are feeding them. this to you. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely falls on the supplier side argument. I suppose. <laughs> so, what what else did you agree with? So, some of his, I would say, he's funny. Yeah, uh, yeah, there were that, some funny bits. Yeah. That that probably yeah. that to an extent falls under the he writes well. Yeah, it's, I think it's hard. Part of this. That's he, an extra compliment he is funny. because I think it is hard to write mm. comedy. Or yeah, to convey a comedy. In pure writing. Yeah. And it's... Yeah, which is impressive. And he, he was consistently amusing for 150 odd yeah. pages. And that's that's impressive. Is this the sort of humour that everyone's going to appreciate? No. No, probably <laughs> not. But this is, this is not woke humour. <laughs> this is no. decidedly the opposite of woke humour. So, some of the enjoyment of the humour will be giggling at, oh, you're not meant to say that, are you? Yeah. Yeah. But still, bit of shock. He he got he got some laughs, he got and some that's laughs. that's good. You have you have to respect that. Yeah, it's extremely dark humor, vi- often violent, and uh, a fair bit of shock value, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I found some of 
Look, it's very rambly at times. <laughs> it's yeah. the entire well, thing is, it's, is rambly. I mean, we preference... Well, it is It is a stream of consciousness yeah. book, so... There is no part of this that isn't rambly. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just rambly. That's what you paid for when, yeah. you, when you get the book. So, it is what it is. You can't really complain. But so, some of his diatribes, or his monologues, were actually interesting. I don't know if I'd say that they were super insightful... I don't feel like at any point I I came across a concept that I felt like mm. I either hadn't heard before or was such an interesting new spin on things. But mm. they were they were kind of interesting. What I found interesting overall was the idea that a person actually thinks like this, and mm. that presumably he has a lot of people who follow him who also think like this <laughs> or think similarly. And I find that really interesting. So, some of the things that are interesting is he's an accelerationist. So, accelerationism is... I mean, there's lots of flavors of this. Mm. And Jack probably knows more about this than I do. But largely speaking, it's the idea that we should accelerate what's happening in society around, say, technological development. Because it it will the system will collapse in on itself. So, we, yeah. we need to do that faster. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure acceleration is is originally a Marxist concept. I believe so, yeah. Of trying to emphasise the contradictions inherent within capitalism to accelerate capitalism's demise at the hands of the proletariat. He takes it in a different direction. I would be very surprised if Mike Ma were a Marxist. Uh, I'm sure he's not a Marxist. Extremely (laughs) surprised. But he definitely... He follows... Like we've we've listened to a number of people who are anti modernists. Mm. So Bronze Age, Pervert, Unabomber. Yeah, Papa Ted. Papa Ted, yeah. Probably Terence McKenna is an anti modernist yeah. in some yeah. ways. And uh also Julius Evola. So that it's a strong theme in the show so far. And Mike Mars anti modernism and accelerationism is kind of a bit more nebulous than the others he didn't he wasn't too specific i'd say you can you can work out probably what he's getting at also having read bronze age mindset yeah so much of what mike ma talks about is so reminiscent of what bronze age pervert talks about that i'm i might end up ascribing certain ideas of bronze age perverts to mike ma yes just because those wires have gotten crossed in my head because they're so similar in what they talk about. To me, his his accelerationism seems to be that you're, like Marxist accelerationism, you're trying to emphasise the contradictions within our our lower world. I think he calls it a few times. Within, world, our, yeah. within our fallen... The degenerate world. Degenerate the society. The world of appearances. Yeah. yeah and mere becoming. And you, <laughs> and you, I'm surprised you, this wasn't dedicated to, to Julius Evola. <laughs> and you, you basically do this by being a nuisance, really. <laughs> yeah, he was, like, in that way, he was yeah. kind of similar to um, Solanus, what, Solanus, the fuck just, up brigade. Yeah, he would be on board with a fuck up brigade, but not of uh, just not of women. hardcore, you know, uh, recalcitrant bitches, yeah. scum. He would be yeah, not, not. He would be not groovy, impetuous. <laughs> <laughs> Violent bitches. Violent bitches getting down on the universe. Yeah. No, none of that. He's like the opposite. <laughs> like, yeah. He's like, Go and cause a bunch of havoc. And also part of that havoc is like punching women in the face and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And he'll be like throwing throwing rocks at cars yep. when they're going down a, a freeway or something like that. To cause a collision. To cause a massive... He had a daydream about causing this massive like 50 car pile up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and that's, that's in service what he's accelerating to. It's just seemed kind of pretty kind of... similar to Bronze Age Herbert's yes. idea of what you should go towards, which was like nature connection to nature. Yeah, he talks about when he t- you can probably infer to an extent what he wants to accelerate towards by what he talks about liking. Yes, and he'll talk about how yeah. we should all be sad because we're never going to get to wake up in the beautiful sun. He really likes the sun. He really likes the you sun. You wake up in the beautiful sun in a body that say would make a Greek statue. Feel envious. <laughs> you That's wake up, it. you look up at the blue sky between these gorgeous marble arches in the clean air without technology, without social media, without subscription services, without 
a government feeding you poison of the mind without feeding you food poison, without any of this stuff, you get to enjoy that. At the back of the book, he has, remember, aggravation is acceleration. I'm talking about the... Is it the pine tree party or something? Yeah. <laughs> he seems like such a troll. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, he, well, he's, he's a new right troll. Yeah. <laughs> It wouldn't surprise me if he spent a lot of time on the lit boards or something like that. <laughs> it's, ba- it's basically if 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 lit, if a litizen got off their ass and wrote a book, it would be harassment architecture. What yeah. what what he seems to be aiming for is some sort of pre-industrial society. He really seemed to like ancient Greece, the Bronze Age mindset kind of thing again. Yeah, I think he talked about an age of piracy. In passing as well. Did he? Hmm. Maybe, yeah, maybe. This might this might be my my memory blurring. It's Dr. Alzheimer's might be visiting early. <laughs> my my recollection of harassment architecture and Bronze Age mindset are bleeding into each other. But yeah, he he seems to want acceleration towards the collapse of industrial society. So we can go <laughs> back to this this golden age to Periclean Athens or something like that. Oh, what I found interesting, yeah, it's related to the accelerationism, but okay, he's extremely cynical, <laughs> yeah, and extremely. So uh, we'll read some of the quotes in a moment, but a lot of his daydreams are extremely violent, and he talks about you know how different parts of the world suck and how New York mm. sucks and how. Everything LA, LA sucks. sucks and everything sucks. Yeah. Um, however, because of his accelerationism, he's also weirdly optimistic. Like, yeah. He has these moments where he's either reminiscing about the way that the world was, or the way, or daydreaming about the way the world could be after the inevitable collapse because <laughs> of the acceleration. Yeah. And he's very like. Uh, optimistic about oh yes it would be really nice like we'll have lots of sun and god is in the sun god's in the trees god's in you know working out and all yeah. that sort of stuff and i found that, that, that that's that was a very strange juxtaposition mm-hmm. between his extreme cynicism and violence and the rather wholesome optimism or yeah, <laughs> the, the optimism for a god-fearing post-industrial world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which then also ties into the other thing that I found interesting. I don't know how coherent his worldview is. I suppose it's hard to tell. But his religiosity, so he's... Yeah, yeah. He's, he's very Christian. He doesn't sort of go into specifics of it. But he's clearly quite religious and... I presume in the sort of American Protestant tradition, conservative, obviously, writing for Breitbart. (laughs) But the juxtaposition of saying things like, oh, God likes, like, you know, God is this good thing, or God will be, you know, angry with us or happy with Mm. us. And then also just how much he... He just hates everyone <laughs> and, how, <laughs> and how violent he is. <laughs> it's, it's this massive mismatch. It's like, well, wasn't Jesus and God, at, at least one interpretation yeah. <laughs> is that Jesus was all about love that and depends, forgiveness. Depends on the gospel you read. <laughs> yeah. I guess it depends what's, what denomination you yeah. follow. <laughs> his, his religiosity was interesting because I wouldn't... So it... Part, part of it is just the form that this book took in that this this is a, a piece of fiction. This is not him setting out in a in a rigorous way, these are my beliefs. Yeah. It's fiction. So you expect some fuzziness from that. But I, yeah, his, his religiosity doesn't seem to be of any particular denomination or school. And it's odd. He'll talk about how, of course, God exists. God sacrificed his son for our sins and things like that. But then doesn't seem to particularly like organized religion or Christian churches and things like that. So I'm not quite sure where <laughs> yeah, what's where he it? sits on this. I think he he might have, have a series of personal beliefs based on a hodgepodge of Christianity and a bunch of other things as well. 
And this would be a divergence from Bronze Age Pervert, who was much more Nietzschean in his view and really didn't seem to think much of Christianity, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's difficult to pin this guy down. Yeah. Yeah, which is probably somewhat of, intentional. I think a lot of it is intentional, because he he complains a lot that people are too ironic today. Yeah, while, this, <laughs> while being incredibly this, this, ironic. This book is just a miasma of irony. It's... <laughs> Yeah. So I thought what we could do is I, I would like to read the last section of the book, yeah. the, the very last. It, it's, a, it's a nice last section because it kind of demonstrates some of the things that we're talking about, about his optimism and also his cynicism and his accelerationism it sort of alludes to it. Then we can work backwards, like start with the end and then mm. we can pull up some of our quotes yeah, yeah. out the book. How, about, how does that sound? That sounds good because we're still working out how to approach fiction on this podcast yes which we need to talk about at the end of the podcast we've only <laughs> dealt with books that talked about the hardest of truths <laughs> no, until now so yes <laughs> so this is the final section i don't know if you'd call them chapters i guess they're chapters sort of a chapter yeah what's okay. it called the chapter titles actually can be pretty good yeah so this is the final chapter the chapter's title is super energy world collider I see demons in the artificial. I see demons in alcohol. I see demons in fluorescent lights. I see demons in doctors, scientists, dealers of data. I see demons in agriculture. I see demons in cars. I see demons in activism. I see demons in most women. I see God in raw meat. I see God in rare meat. I see God when I bathe in the sun. I see God in low blood sugar. (laughs) Yeah, he's got the thing. I see God in pine trees. I see God in most all trees. I see God in a few good men. I see God when I breathe the right way. I see God when I stand up straight. I see God during fasts. I saw God and he told me to burn it all down. I saw a boy and his father on the sidewalk today. They walked like they had somewhere to be. Then the sky crashed down. All of it, everywhere. It was loud and covered all you could see. That boy. He squealed. He giggled. He danced. To the ears did his smile extend. He wasn't happy because his school would be cancelled today. He was thrilled because the world may just end. Yeah, yeah, that's the perfect quote for this. <laughs> he's got but this is why he's he's just like the internet or a particular type of young man who spends too much time on the internet is distilled because he's got the thing about yeah. <laughs> spiking spiking your blood sugar is bad. I don't disagree because I'm a man who spends too much time on the internet as well. He really <laughs> likes fasting, which Jack loves fucking fasting. I also quite <laughs> Jack like. occasionally <laughs> does like three day fasts. Like, do it every month. Probably, probably. Oh, occasionally, yeah, <laughs> regularly does three day fasts. <laughs> They're really good. Yeah, I haven't bothered. <laughs> Maybe why I'm so pudgy. <laughs> the sun. I'm too much of an Australian. I just get nervous when I'm in direct sunlight because I don't want to get melanoma <laughs> because the sun here fries you to a crisp. Yeah, to me, he's... I have almost felt as though reading parts of it reminded me of myself when I was like 16 or 17. Yeah, just but I'm the pretty pure, sure. Pure angst, except obviously with slight cultural differences. But yeah. I mean, the, the tone, the angst. Yeah, the, yeah. It is... I don't know when he, how old he was when he wrote this. This was published in 2019. If he's in his sort of late 20s now. He was born in 95. So, so okay. So, he'd be 27 now then. So, mm-hmm. did I do my math correctly? Yeah, close enough. Yeah, 27 this year. So, he wrote this when he was like 23-ish. Mm. I, I'm surprised stacks that... Up. <laughs> it, it stacks up. Although, it it does feel a lot more teenage than... Although, then again, Nirvana... You know, how old they were in their mid twenties and they were still making their music. So yeah, I guess it stacks up. Yeah, yeah, yep. Anyways, should we get into quotes? Yeah, yeah. Let's get into quotes because when we when we read out quotes, that's that's the thing about the book that's most fun because you get to experience his writing. And from the quotes, we can also discuss the things that we liked. Yeah, didn't like. I took extensive notes on this. <laughs> 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 I mean, what about we start with the very first bit of the book? Okay. Because I reckon that, like, it just, it sums up so much, so much of it. I've got it here. Like, you, you don't need, need to flick, flick to a different part. Yeah, because 
He starts out, he says, If you came here expecting coherent plot or structure, you bought or stole the wrong book. And then dedicates the book to Bronze Age Pervert. As an aside, he does the thing that Bronze Age Pervert does, where sometimes he just won't use articles. Do you think that's With certain nouns. With him, well, with Mike Meyer, because he's a native English speaker, it must be intentional. I wonder whether he's imitating how Bronze Age Pervert might, might be getting English wrong. How many times do you think this book was edited? Uh, like once or Once, twice. maybe. There's the odd spelling type. error, but nothing, nothing that. Like, bad. But missing like, an article, like I'm, like if you're typing it out, and especially he might have been dexed out while he was reading this. So, <laughs> so like I don't know, missing an article is not. Was it often enough that it's alluding to Bronze yeah. Age pervert? I'm not sure. Maybe I'm reading too much into you this. You might be reading a little bit too much. Into anyway, it. but the book starts where he's in his car, blasting Wagner, right? Uh, yeah, so good. He's listening to, <laughs> he's good listening to Wagner and he says, I'm broadcasting this kind of unhinged but handsome white male wavelength. And there's a woman in the car next <laughs> to him. Unhinged and handsome. And he starts yelling at her. He calls her a bitch. <laughs> and he, he turns up Wagner. She starts edging forward because she's getting more and more nervous. And then he rams into the car in front of him. Yeah. <laughs> and because it's a Prius and he doesn't like that, he drives off. <laughs> and that's... Yeah. <laughs> he says of the woman, because he can see she's nervous, he says, I almost feel bad for her until I realise she didn't reply to my courtship. She truly is a bitch. <laughs> yeah. That's... Like, that... Because each chapter is more or less the same, it's, it's just a rearrangement of the same... That's kind of the book. Like, that scene of him calling a woman a bitch, listening to Wagner and ramming into a Prius and driving off. That's kind of the book. Yep. Yeah. Like, if you want to stop the podcast now, that's... <laughs> that's a good place to end. Or skip to the end and that's, listen to some of That's that harassment remarks. architecture. <laughs> I liked it. I, I would probably recommend it to people, but that is... That's it. That's the book. Yeah. It's, it's 150 pages of, of that. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> on your, but keep on, on listening to, to the podcast. I just thought that <laughs> that quote that that part was good to start with because that's the start, and you'll notice that it doesn't really change from there. Levi's got his quotes. I expect they're going to be pretty much the same as that. Yeah. One of the things I liked about the book was the punchy. Uh, punchiness of the sarcasm and the humour and also the sort of anti-humour that mm. it has or anti-jokes but I didn't like he's, he's really quite racist <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um, I didn't like the racism so my first quote was something where I felt quite quite conflicted because I liked the humour but I didn't like the racism <laughs> he, he said you read the words God is dead online and didn't investigate didn't investigate his context any further. That's really an- interesting, and I would definitely love to hear more. You know what's dead? Pretending to care about minorities. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, this, was this the bit where he was at a concert and it was a post-rock band and yeah. he complained that he didn't like post-rock and yeah. then a woman kept trying to talk to him and he didn't like her? There's a common theme that attractive women will talk to Mike Ma or <laughs> not Mike Ma, but he's far too cool. <laughs> To, like, to respond to their advances. It's, it's also got a, a bit about... A, a, so it shows his attitudes t- towards women. A little bit further down, it says, Come is God, also known as pay attention to me. I'm a different kind of slut. Kick out your car's rear windshield, tie a chain around both a lamppost and your neck, leave a respectable amount of slack, drive forward and fast. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> it's just like... It's demented. I think yeah. that's what I'd describe it as. Really demented at times. Mm-hmm. What about... The bit where he talks about New York. I guess in the chapter part, following yeah. that. I've got, yeah, a, I've, got a, a I've got a longer quote here where he's talking about New York. So he says of it, It's a city that dove too deeply, too quickly into the world of technology and the idea of a melting pot, then realised how empty that future felt. Occasionally, they'll try to claw their way back to former days, but can only poorly mimic them. Burger shacks that rely solely on iPads as cash registers that cook their food using intentionally dated stoves and tools, manic NYU students in ugly H&M sweatpants staring into their $20 minimalist salads, sitting uncomfortably at rustic wood tables, 
artificially banged up by crafty Chinatown merchants. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, yeah. I really like... He, he's somewhat like Valerie Solanas in that way, where he's got, yeah. a, he's got a vicious tongue, a vicious wit. Yeah, which yeah. Which, I guess... Over 150 pages did tire on me, but I appreciated it. <laughs> I felt if there were a plot, it wouldn't have tired me. Yeah. But because it because it never changed, yes. I felt like I, well, I could read, say, 20 pages of this. Would have been great. Yeah. And then, then I probably would recommend it to most people. I'd say, yeah, give it a shot. Yeah. It's or still, if you saw... Because it, did, it didn't change over 150 pages, I started to feel like, well, why, why do you have this bit? Yeah. And uh, not another bit. became it's, somewhat yeah. repetitive. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Extremely. extremely repetitive. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I feel like if he's a good writer of nonfiction, like you were saying, he is writing for Breitbart. Mm. I feel like his, his, the viciousness and the, the humor combined, if you added that sparingly, to, yeah, to an essay or something, it could be really, really uh, good. <laughs> I, I, I feel like so. I haven't read his Breitbart pieces, but I've read Breitbart. Yeah, before. I feel like this is actually well suited to that form of entertainment yeah. news. Yeah, 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 one hundred percent. So it's with gothic violence. I'd be very interested to see if it has a plot, and if it does, then I'll read it. Yeah, if it does, and I don't know if I'd have the patience to. Do yeah, it. If, probably, it, if it's essentially like this for another hundred and fifty. Yeah, minutes. I probably wouldn't bother. If it has a plot, I would read it outside of the podcast, which is probably the highest praise I've given anything yeah, we've read on this is, podcast. That is the so, you yeah. could give a book on this podcast. So I've got I've got a quote. He's, he's uh, I'll try and find the follow up quote from later in the book. He has a very love hate relationship with love and hate. And yeah. with women, so he, <laughs> he he very he sort of demeans demeans love and romance and women, but then at the same time, in other parts of the book, he'll talk about like how important love is, and mm. you know, in a way, alludes to obviously how much he cares about having a a partner who loves him. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but I'll try and find the follow up to this to that. But the first part is from the chapter Romancipation's Highway. Oh, I like this. One. <laughs> the opening paragraph is Romanticism is not buying flowers for your girlfriend. Romanticism is buying flowers for your girlfriends. Romanticism is your wife admitting to you the rapist role play she's been so eager to try. Romanticism is a gunshot victim dabbing his fingers into the wound, painting stripes on his face before the medics arrive. Romanticism is hunting down local grinder users and beating them with a phone book or a sock full of coins. Romanticism is voluntary celibacy. Romanticism is baseball bat hate crimes. Romanticism is total debauchery or total anti-debauchery. Romanticism is sex, and sex is just a fight where you come at the end. (laughs) <laughs> he's got he's got quite a few chapters like that where he'll just repeat himself over and over again but he does it well that's a good he, he does it well yeah yeah it's <laughs> really funny <laughs> oh man what about the bit where so you're talking about how he's got a conflicted relationship with women there's this bit where he's talking about he's explaining to a friend what thoughts are and that's that's when he's when he's not really conflicted when he's really book. not conflicted about women. He's you know, he's telling his friend, thoughts are a commodity. They are there when you need to unload pent up testosterone, and generally they'll never interject themselves into your actual life, your actual relationships, or whatever else. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have a death squad that rounds them up for execution. It just means that we should use them for what they're trained for until they are gone. <laughs> Starts advocating mass graves full of thoughts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He really, uh, yeah. I guess that's a contradiction that he said. Like, uh, romanticism is complete debauchery or complete anti-debauchery. Mm. He's it's not he's, it's not entirely clear to me what he thinks of sex. I guess he he's probably con- conservative with regards to sex. No, I'm not sure. I don't know where to place this. So this is. I mean, but, but this this is the typical online new right. 4chan user who who communicates with so many layers of irony that they probably don't quite know what they they believe anymore yeah yeah or maybe not it's fiction he's got he does say so of irony he says nihilism and irony are really neat until you're dead and the only person who remembers you is your weed dealer 
<laughs> that's an excellent <laughs> that's quote. That's what I quote. That's and what I put on Twitter. I, I don't <laughs> disagree with that. I think that's just correct. <laughs> I think nihilism and irony are really fashionable at the moment. And I, I don't exempt myself from this fashion. I can't, I can't help it. But, but it is at the expense of sincerity. Yeah. There is, sincerity is quite unfashionable at the moment. Do you think? Yeah. Hmm. Do you think people just, I think, get, I think, just get shut down for it? I maybe. think non-performative sincerity. Get shut down. So people or... will be sincere about things. They'll, they'll be sincere about very fashionable things. They'll say, I'm being sincere about my anxiety. I'm, yeah. I'm being brave it's talking about in, it. in vogue. Yeah. Whereas non, non-performative sincerity, I think, is mostly looked down on. Yeah. He makes some interesting points. I think, I think the thing about this guy, Mike Ma, Bronze Age... Maybe other people in the bright body sort of space. Mm. They they actually do. I disagree with them about a lot of things, but they pick up on a lot of the bullshit that's happening over on like the left, mm-hmm. and I guess maybe just more mainstream in general. Things like yeah, the fake sincerity. Like they 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 have they they pick up they they can be insightful with regards to their criticism of like mainstream culture. Yeah, in a and in in oftentimes really funny way, like Milo, <laughs> Milo Yiannopoulos, the way that he used to carry on, although he got cancelled. I'm pretty sure Mike Mann knows Milo yeah, Yiannopoulos. Wouldn't surprise me, although he's extremely homophobic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I do appreciate that about them because I'll just call out mm. people's bullshit, even though I don't know if I agree with most of what they say. But yeah, mm. that's a good point. So that's that's something that's something I like. He uh, he he acknowledges that there's a lack of sincerity. Yes, yes. While writing a book that much of the time is extremely insincere, <laughs> but the book every now and then will have just a page which is a picture with um, say block text on it describing a scene. Mm. He's got one about his racism. He's yeah. the the text over a picture says. The year is 2059 and racism is illegal. It's illegal, but I still get off on it. I need it. Eating steak at exclusive new chop house, I send my compliments to the chef. I can see from afar he's black. My compliments were the N-word. The hairs of my arms stand. I'm going to kill myself every day for the rest of my life. Tap water breaks your fast. <laughs> That's the... So it's, he'll have these pictures and then also he'll have chapters where... He just chops up, almost like Burroughs did. Like, he'll just chop sentences in half and yeah, rearrange them. He plays around with uh, the actual position of sentences and paragraphs. And and maybe that that's some form of progression as the book goes on. So the plot doesn't progress, but things like chopping up sentences and rearranging them do increase. So, it, and, and I he, suppose that's he's got this whole extent. He's got this whole section where he's talking about intentional sleep deprivation. So yeah. maybe, maybe the overall plot could be seen as kind of this delinquent, gradual slide into more and more extremism and more and more insanity and mm-hmm. becoming less and less stable in a way. Kind of, again, kind of echoing American Psycho. Um, and at the at the end, it sort of in the last third of the book somewhere, last quarter, he uh I mean we can find the quote, but he he causes a like a, a ten car pile up or something by yeah, throwing rocks. Yeah. And that in that section he prefaces it by saying, Hey, all the other times I was either hallucinating or mm. dreaming or daydreaming, but this time yeah. I'm not. This is I actually did this. And and um, and so through the lens of kind of American psycho um, mental uh, decay point of view, maybe the story is, hey, this guy is like sort of in his head a lot, this presumably young man, and he's got these accelerationist dreams and he never really acts them out mm. and he's constantly fantasizing about them. But as he like becomes more and more unhinged and you know, obviously has sleep deprivation and stuff. He eventually actually does something. And yeah, then yeah, very yeah. quickly wraps up at the end and he sort of says like, oh yeah, like God is all these good things. And yeah. because wasn't it, he got arrested or something and then busted out of jail by people in an armored vehicle. And he didn't say who they were and they drove him off to a forest. Yeah. And then he started talking to people there and encouraging them to accelerate. Yeah. 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 
And then and then threw stones at cars. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's... And, I uh, guess that's maybe plot. And, but... and potentially those people... Could, at some point earlier in the book, he talks about how there's a band of homeless people living in a forest who, oh, keep, on, yeah. who keep on causing property damage to a car dealership, which I, <laughs> I found really funny. Oh, yeah, so I, to, I was wondering, would, would that ever come back up? And potentially... the And he talks about going up to the car dealer and saying hey, you've got these people causing all this damage. The cops aren't going to do anything about it. So if you really want it sorted out, like, come talk to me. We'll yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll kill them. Uh, we'll, we'll go kill them. One interpretation of the scene where he gets busted out of the jail and dropped off in the forest could be that maybe the random people in the forest that are causing all the property damage, which is kind of what he advocates as mm-hmm. a sort of destructive accelerationist, is actually them. Yeah. And, uh, he actually likes them for causing the property damage to the car dealership and then also eggs them on. Yeah. And yeah. then goes and causes his own property damage. Oh, well, not fair. I mean, causes a car pile up and a bunch of people to die. <laughs> that's, oh, that might that's... be the most generous way I could interpret it. Yeah. The, as like giving it some form of coherent Plot. narrative. You know how I was saying earlier that he blamed our bad diet and stuff like that and bad lifestyle on some sort of conspiracy... Mm. And I, I, I put words in his mouth. I said maybe, in his view, Jews or Asians, because he doesn't seem to like either of those groups who are responsible. I found a quote here. He says it's the Grandmasters. Yeah. So he says, <laughs> The Grandmasters don't want us dead. They want us weak and subservient, obviously. This is nothing new, but finding out exactly what does it, well, that is new. Fluoride in the water, hormones in the milk, gender dysmorphia in the air. So, so <laughs> the, the, dysmorphia in the, the Grand Masters. I, I, he, but he never says, "Oh, it's the Jews, or it's the Asians, or it's the Rockefellers, or it's the, mm. um, you know, Clintons." Or like, he doesn't get that specific. Just there's, there is some cabal of people, <laughs> presumably technocratic capitalist types, maybe also the Washington types, mm-hmm. presumably, but it's not. That specific. Yeah, he hates Washington. He calls it a graveyard or something. something. He hates Washington. And he hates New York and he hates LA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a bit that I wanted to read, which I really liked. Yeah. This was... um, This is... This is... Just a random part of the book. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if it relates to anything, really. It's, it's uh, The chapter is some time to overhear. As of late, I've been writing down things said by both myself and others around me. The criteria is simply this. It must be worth writing down. I'm on a juice cleanse, you shitty f***. Random girl upon being offered an apple fritter. I can't stop jacking off, dude. Seriously. It's like every time I think I got it under control, there's something that sets me off. Seriously, dude. Like, it could be anything. Yesterday, I was was four days, days clean. I saw some girl's thighs on a YouTube thumbnail. Next thing I know, I'm searching for chubby girl porn. <laughs> College kids sitting with friend waiting for his ride. <laughs> Can you check out this girl's Insta page for me? She wants to meet up later and I think she might have a dick, but I'm not sure. You can't tell anymore, man. Two guys sharing a drink in a bar midday. How about a slut holocaust? No, really. Why not, right? I'll wait for an argument. Not myself, and not recently. <laughs> I got raped at a farmer's market once, and I haven't been able to look at produce since. Girl in line at a food line. The only thing standing between me and starting a fatty holocaust is the locked doors of every PepsiCo bottling warehouse. Seriously, who drinks pe- Pepsi nowadays besides straight-up fat asses? Nobody drinks Pepsi, dude. Let's just poison it and watch all the right people die off. Not myself. Not ever. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, <laughs> it's just a whole... It's like another couple of pages of these sorts of quotes. It's just, what is going on? These are just things that he liked people hearing. (laughs) He'll have those sort of gimmick chapters where... I remember there was another chapter called um, Nap That Feels Like Fever Dream where he starts it out all lowercase and he says that it's to attract a new demographic and then he starts just having everything in uppercase. (laughs) And he's talking to some woman called Sophia that he doesn't like. About how he's watching her all the time, how he watches her, like, search for very specific types of porn online. It's, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the interspersion of, it's not, it's it's not stream of consciousness, it's, uh, it's, he just changes it up It's just whatever he wants. inconsistent, yeah. But, you know, in a way that he's a good enough writer that I think it's fairly okay most Mm -hmm. of the time. You don't know what's coming next. (laughs) Yeah. 
He talks about God a bit in Eagles Descending Upon Capistrano with Tongues Like Wilted Flowers Forever. Because he says that we used to be able to reach God and we used to see God, but we don't anymore because of technology. He says, Heaven's light is snubbed by shields of internet work, Bluetooth connections, and phone line entanglements. He goes on to say, The way I see it, Sins are only sins when unleashed upon a world that doesn't deserve it. A world that you don't want to see hurt. Better known as the previous world. So he he has an idea of sin. He just doesn't think sins apply in our current world because we don't have contact with God because of technology. Yeah. So you should accelerate this world to destroy technology so we can get back to God. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? That's very... I, uh... I think, but... That's extremely Kaczynski. He must have read Kaczynski. I'm sure he's read... These sort of people love Papa Ted. Yeah. <laughs> he's got an interesting perspective on uh, on beauty. Yeah. He, he cares about aesthetics, and not just with regards to Ziz, <laughs> Ziz and, and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, although I'm sure he loves those people. Um, he has this bit where he's talking about, like, why we... The chapter's called Why We Hurt, and... He says, oh, there oh, could be a bunch one. of reasons why we hurt, but they're all wrong. And the reason why we hurt is because we're separated from, from beauty, which I found mm. really... Uh, this is actually one of the things I found interesting. So to quote, Whether we can consciously distinguish between beauty and anti-beauty, I believe our subconscious contains its own accurate radar. When we see beauty, we feel as humans should, captivated, inspired, grounded, proud, Simply being in the presence of the visually pleasing inspires the creation of more just like it. At the very least, it inspires the hope to one day create something similar. That powerful feeling combined with the abandonment of typical modern artist characteristics, sloth, nihilism, regression for attention, poor education, is what I imagine the Greeks embodied. When you think about an artist, someone who truly understands touching asceticism, uh, aesthetic, Aesthetic? Yes. Did I pronounce that correctly? Um, aestheticism? Aest- yeah, aestheticism. Your brain should envision a physically fit and well-read male with beliefs that don't <laughs> deteriorate the culture he creates. The artist wakes up and aches to understand the world surrounding him. What is an artist? A man who gets it. <laughs> so, obviously, <laughs> he has an extremely, <laughs> an extremely particular view of what he thinks an artist is and what beauty is. Oh, but yeah. I did find it interesting that aesthetics... And beauty came up in, in this sort yeah. of way. Yeah. And quite often. Yeah. And so it, it's reflected in the way that he talks about, say, New York. Mm. Um, he refers to things, you know, like the greyness of the concrete and all this sort of stuff. And I can see that also in Bronze Age. Yeah. The mm-hmm. importance of, yeah, beauty, of aesthetics, and how that enriches us. I, I would agree with him on that part. Mm hmm. I don't necessarily think that only men can create nice, nice, <laughs> beautiful art, but I would agree with him on that. And probably some of his criticisms of modern art, I would also agree with. Yeah, he was talking... I remember there was one section where he was saying that the modern world is so ugly that comparatively art in, say, hotel lobbies or... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, or, or business building lobbies looks nice because everything is just so horrible, it's so, horrible, so yeah. ugly. Yeah, yeah. He he's a music fan as well. There's this yeah. band called Home Shake. <laughs> he talks about their at the time of writing most recent album. I did listen to them. They've got more albums. Their their then latest album, Midnight Snack, that he was <laughs> is a very big fan of. He talks about I think Death in June or something like that. <laughs> Some neo folk band which uses Nazi imagery a bit. Too often for it to be an accident. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect those sorts of music, th- those bands to appeal to him so much. He mentioned listening to Behemoth, which doesn't surprise me. That's more what I imagined. <laughs> and obviously he listens to Electric Wizard because there's a video of him playing like, one of their songs. So. Yeah, he's or at least, got at least a riff. He's got, so. an, he's got an eclectic yeah, sense of yeah. music. Yes. Yeah. I guess. So I... I I like right. Behemoth and Electric Wizard, so there's there's some overlap. Yeah. At least. It's just, just also the to... fact that he also likes that synth stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's just an interesting mix. I just uh, came across this. We said that he must have read Ted Kaczynski's writing. Yeah. He in this in the 
section called Not Enough Violence. He's <laughs> talking about how you can distinguish good from bad oh, criminals. Yeah, that's actually a really on, good chapter. Yeah, yeah. Based on their, <laughs> not their <enough>. style. <laughs> and not just not just how well dressed they are, but the, pin, the, the, the panache did, they did put you, into you write it down? Their, their crimes. He says violence without good story or style is barbaric at best. You can get away with a lot if you look a little better. Maximise looks to maximise crime, and in that, accelerate better. Consider it crime maxing. <laughs> so he's... He obviously... He knows the, the black pill looks Max Linger. But it's he so gave, he gave, Crime maxing. He gave examples of, of good criminals. Yeah. Like the Columbine shooters, Elliot Rogers, Kaczynski, and Killdozer. I had to Kill look up Dozer. Killdozer. It was... It's fucked. Yeah, it's this re- guy tell who, them the story of Killdozer. I don't know it. I don't know that much detail, but it was some guy, I think, in the US... Who I think he was having a fight with the local pl- local government over some planning problem. Yeah. So he got a bulldozer, armor plated it, armor plated himself inside it, like he couldn't leave. Stacked a bunch of guns in it, and then went on a rampage. He didn't shoot anyone, and he didn't kill anyone. He just caused a ton of property damage <laughs> by by bulldozing houses and things like that. So he was killed over. He had a bunch of guns as well and like he had a, a bunch- porthole port to shoot out. Yeah, to, and to shoot out of, but he didn't do it. He didn't kill anyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. But, and I mean, also the, he got called Killdozer. The name killed <laughs> the name Killdozer gets your attention. That's 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 pretty solid. But he makes a good point because people like uh the Boston Marathon bomber he uh He's got like a huge foot. Like, there's he's got like fangirls and stuff. He's I think just it's, is he really looking? handsome? Yeah, yeah. It was like he was on the cover of Rolling Stones, and Rolling Stones got grilled for it. They're like people are like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, it's because Rolling Stone. Everyone who's ever written there's a fucking vulture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a guy who blew up a bunch of people at, mm. in, in, had a marathon because he was so good looking. Earned earned a cover of. Earned a place on the cover of Rolling Stone. The cover of Rolling Stone. Yeah, but you can. So he makes with, a point. with Rolling Stone, and this is the type of bullshit actually that someone like Mike <laughs> Ma talks about. So, so the the Tsana F boys who who were responsible for the Boston Marathon bombings, bombing a bunch of people's cool. If they used the N word while they were doing it, Rolling Stone wouldn't touch him. Oh, yeah, if they used a homophobic slur while they were doing it, that wouldn't be cool. That's not all right. That's offensive. That's problematic. That's problematic. Blowing, it's so <laughs> problematic. <laughs> Blowing up a bunch of people is sick, though. That's cool. That'll get you on the cover of Rolling Stone. Sick. Yeah, and I guess they got diversity and inclusion points, right? Because they yeah, were, were... Where are they from? Or oh, weren't they... Were, 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 ethnic were, yeah, were ethnically Dagestani or yeah, Chechen or something. Dagestan. Uh, well, I don't know. You know who else is from Dagestan? Khabib. <laughs> Khabib. Khabib. <laughs> Khabib. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the animal, the bear. <laughs> Khabib, that guy's fucking, fucking terrifying. Yeah, he's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dagestan. I, I love Dagestan now. I want to go there and have a look at the kids wrestling bears. So, I, uh, oh yeah, don't you think that that word problematic is like a dead giveaway? when you, If you're having a conversation and as per, these days, if somebody says like, oh, that thing is problematic... Mm. Most of the time, to me, it's like a dead giveaway that you're talking to somebody who's like way An too woke. Fuck woke. <laughs> What's the, the problem with the word problematic is it's a great way to signal to someone that you don't agree with them and signal to people who agree with you that you don't agree with the bad person without having to say exactly why you don't agree with them. Yeah. It's a type of person who'll just stop you talking and go, yikes. <laughs> you just want to <laughs> kick him in the fucking head when they say it. I I think it's interesting because it's it's a way of silencing people mm. and uh, shutting down a conversation without actually uh, yeah. without actually engaging in a disagreement. Yeah, exactly. A civil disagreement. You can okay. I don't agree yeah. that you have perspective X mm-hmm. instead of saying I disagree with you and here's why. You say oh mm-hmm. that's problematic. Yeah, and you've you've essentially signaled. One, your virtue signaled yourself, mm. and you're signaling to the other person that they should be quiet. Yeah. And most of the time, when I've seen it happen in my own life in conversations, it just uh, shuts down the conversation and makes it weird and awkward. And and or people who 
agree with the person saying problematic, just like heap on. Mm. Yeah. To me, it says that whoever is saying it, whoever is saying something like, they'll stop you talking. You'll be talking about something totally unrelated and they'll go, um, okay, well, sounds like you hate women, but that's fine. <laughs> has that actually happened to That you? hasn't happened to me, but <laughs> you could imagine it happening. I've been, I, I've been in a group of people standing around where one person has said that to another. Mm-hmm. Apropos of almost, of, of nothing. Yeah, and, does it, and, and what it says to me is basically you're talking with someone who is going to assume the absolute worst. Yes. In everything that's, you say. That's, that's a good and way of putting it. you think like it's a total fucking waste of my time to talk to this person. Yeah, because you don't... The people who use that sort of language and what was the way that you put it just then? They're, just, they're going to assume the worst yes. in everything. everything you say. So they're, they're, they're looking for things yeah. to, to grill people on. And it makes me feel... As though, look, I, uh, I'm not homophobic, I'm not racist, mm. or at least I, I try not to be. <laughs> not transphobic. Generally, like, have a lot of fairly socially progressive points of view. Probably, probably. But then whenever I'm around people who use the word problematic and that sort of stuff, I always mm. feel like I'm work- walking on eggshells. And yeah. uh, it's really, it's incredibly uncomfortable. I mean, it's, it's essentially a form of, like, thought policing, really. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> so that's something that we agree with Mike Maher on, because yeah. I am positive he doesn't like and these people either. E- even though Mike Maher's racist and homophobic, I don't know, like, he might actually not be nearly as racist, homophobic, misogynistic as he portrays in this book, mm. merely because partially what he's doing is he's also just, like, poking the yeah, target. It's, it's, it's like, just he's shocking. throwing knives um, at these people that, like, the people who say problematic, mm. Mike Maher... Fucking hates those people. Yeah, yeah. And this book is him just trying to, <laughs> yeah, trying to get twist a, the get a rise in, out of them, get a rise out of them. Which you know, when when you're when you're suppressing conversation, whether it's in actual dialogue, like mm. person person conversation, or whether it's on Twitter, or whether it's in things like newspapers mm. and the way that you see some fucking like more like left wing talk journalists write, the way they fucking write is so patronising. When you see that, doesn't that just even even as somebody who often agree, even if I do agree with them, the way that they're imposing through sort of shame or other, you know, social signaling or whatever is so grating that mm. it makes me almost just want to disagree with them yeah. just because yeah. they're so insufferable. They might be saying something that ostensibly that I, that I agree with agree as well. With. But I, d- I just want to take the other side. Yeah, just it's it's, it's like we we live in this. Uh, there's an asymmetric advantage at the moment in uh, social dialogue in countries like Australia, and I don't think it's the case in Czech by the sounds of it as much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in countries like Australia and America, where because you don't want to be seen as racist, and being racist is really bad, or being homophobic, or just I don't, pick a group, mm. or it's, it's the worst thing you can do. It's like the baby shot someone dead in a Walmart. Didn't get cancelled. <laughs> insulted you, gay people insulted got cancelled. Got cancelled, yeah. yeah. So there's this massive asymmetric advantage that you can basically bring down the might of mm. whether it's a mob online or whether it's a, uh, you know, getting somebody fired mm. and cancelled or whatever. Uh, and it's completely outside. Like, the people have no opportunity to defend themselves or whatever. Mm. Or if it's, you know, like some famous examples people said something 10 years ago Mm. and it's not reflective of their perspective now, but they're getting grilled for it now, which is probably this podcast is going to come back to bite us. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I I think it's a really disgusting thing. The the way that conversation, apparently the the liberal West has Mm -hmm. evolved at least the last 10 years or so. That's why I appreciate Jack's book. I mean, Mike's book. Mike's Mike's book. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I certainly don't feel like I'm walking on eggshells to the same extent in Czech Republic. Yeah, they don't have they have different like uh, social stigmas, presumably. Mm-hmm. Like you're probably not going to be being, make a, friends being if a communist. You're being a communist. Yeah. Anyway, how do we talking about Rolling Stone set us off? I actually think this is a, <laughs> the, no. I think that was a worthwhile conversation. That was a definitely good because that's that's a conversation spurred by reading harassment architecture. By reading harassment architecture, I wonder if I wonder what. Mike Mars' perspectives are on Bitcoin. <laughs> he has this 
bit, he says, my personal fortune is but a few numbers on a screen, Mm -hmm. data on a server, exactly nothing whenever someone or something chooses to swipe it all away. Mm -hmm. And this isn't the case. This is not only the case for me. Everyone could lose everything. You aren't safe liquidating to cash either because cash tears and burns even easier. You should use cash though. Federal agents be damned, eat shit, and (laughs) etc. I assume he likes Bitcoin. Just but assume never- that's not that's not too technological. Oh yeah, that's an interesting. Given that it is it is a cryptographically backed. Okay, I assume yeah, it's on the internet. So yeah. okay, he probably doesn't like Bitcoin because it's too technological, but he probably likes gold, which is close enough to Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> probably likes gold. That's fine. <laughs> Or maybe he just likes bartering and he just wants to live in a small enough community where he can just barter. <laughs> Pay with drachmas or whatever they were paying for in <laughs> Pericles <and> Athens. <laughs> oh, he's got another quote about women. He really likes home gym, so he was kicked out of his gym. I think shouting the N-word at someone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it actually happened or not, but you know, in, in, the book, in the book, he says it. I don't know if Mike Ma did that. But on the basis of this, he decided to build a really, really good home gym. And he likes it too because he can scream while he's working out and do it naked and stuff like that. Yeah. He also says, so he, he compares his experience of how much he loves a home gym to women. He says, women never get home gyms because then nobody would give them the attention they want. It's you really starting to build up the, the, the Mike Ma view of women. <laughs> or the Mike Ma view of <laughs> homosexuals and heterosexuals he says heterosexual white men have created all the greatest works in the world the the world has ever seen if a woman or a gay person published something notable it was first done by a heterosexual white man (laughs) he then says have you ever seen how the gays dress it makes you the kind of angry where your stomach hurts tastelessness doesn't cover it and then he goes on uh he's he's talking about uh Oh, yeah, he realizes that he's in a gay club. He says, scanning the room only invites more rage. There have been worse things to happen than the, the nightclub shooting that happened a couple of years ago at the, at the, night, at the gay club incident. And then he said, it doesn't help that they dress like shooting range targets. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, that's so fucked up. <laughs> that's so fucked up. Yeah, so I think he's almost picked out everything in PC culture. Like yeah. He's, he's almost taken like a trope, say like, oh, yeah, heterosexual white men mm. are bad and women need to be given space and, and homosexual people need to be given space and all, all, all lesbians or whatever. And he basically says that he turns it on its head yeah. and then he makes it violence just to be... I, see, that's the thing. Like, when I view it through this mm. lens, I don't know if he actually is hateful. Yeah, how, or, like, how much is this Mike Maher and how much is it him just poking? Through that lens, I could actually see this as very much... Satire. satire and in fact Mike Ma maybe doesn't hold many of these views mm. and but he believes in one freedom of speech mm. two because he's American so Americans seem to always do things to the extreme <laughs> and and three because he's kind of made a career out of being um, being a troll being a troll and yeah being a reactionary yeah so this entire book could be viewed through lenses it's not really since mike mars sincere points of view but he's picking all the things on the left that he knows are like sacred cows and Mm. he's slaughtering them with an ak-47 yeah yeah doing it in as smarmy a way smarmy and no subtlety just what yeah what would be something that would piss Piss them off off your standard uc berkeley student yeah exactly and, well, and that's what he wants. On, on that note, yeah. <laughs> there's the chapter, A Closer Look at Asians. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> he says, Asians, the world's leaders in revolutionary technology and whatever other garbage shit no one needs around. He goes on to say, I strongly believe that the existence of Asians, specifically the Chinese and Japanese, is an affront to God. He compares Asians. When he says Asians, I assume he means East Asians. Particularly, he he says they're like a bored GTA player who's hundred percent of the game, knows it inside out, and so needs to find new ways to play the game to stay interested. Mm. He then also says that <clears throat> the Chinese are launching an artificial moon to light up the night, mm. and this is evidence they've they've 
they've gotten they've gotten too good. They've min maxed playing normal life, so they're doing weird shit. Yeah, because they can. Would he levy, levy that against like uh, the Saudis and uh, the people in Dubai and stuff who are just you know building artificial islands? And I stuff, think I he assume. only he mentioned, never mentions he Arabs, only does he? he mentioned Arabs once <laughs> with a reference to suicide bombing, as you would yeah, well, as you yeah. would expect from yeah. from this book. I assume he doesn't like Arabs very much. I mean, pr- probably not. But, probably not. But the, it was what you were saying before with how this is fiction. How much of it is reflective of his actual beliefs? And how much is I'm him really questioning that? Really, now. really know. trying it's to really to stir to, people up, and and also trying to like stir up his his audience, yeah, presumably as well. They're yeah, probably like 4chan or whoever the fuck, like r slash red pill, maybe I don't know. Probably fucking love this just for, <laughs> just because it's so incendiary. R slash red pill wouldn't like it because they can't write like they can't write massive tomes in pseudo scientific jargon on r slash red pill. For other red pills to go like, mm, you yeah, know, nice idea. <laughs> really I can't do it with this. Book, so <laughs> uh, he had this. In- it's just, it's, just, it's just really pathetic. That's that's the main thing that irritates me about R slash Red Pill. Yeah, I haven't spent enough time on it <laughs> to comment, but I'll take your word for it. <laughs> if R slash Red Pill is anything like practical female psychology, then sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, in reference to his love-hate relationship with love and hate and Mm. with women, he has this uh, chapter titled, it could be beautiful, you might say beautiful, or it could be (laughs) B-O-T-I-F-E-L. Yeah. (laughs) And he sort of starts off saying how, like, there's this massive gulf between people because, you know, at the end of the day, we can only communicate, but our subjective experiences sort of in some ultimate sense... Um, totally isolated from one another. Uh, he says, there's a sea of difference between all of us, even the ones we think we're closest to, voids between us where certain questions sleep. And he says, it's okay that we are different because once you finally interlock perfectly with someone who understands things the same way you do, you're capable of many things. We are constantly aware of th- this divide. There's not a single moment that it doesn't bury itself into how we view a person, even more so in women. We watch it and wait, preying upon body language and subtle remarks. Uh, blah 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 he says a bunch of stuff and then he starts talking about love and he says to articulate love is to have misunderstood it you are three streets down but in the middle of finding love and not there is a lot of pretending you did with this comes the many realizations that she was only a special stranger the entire time the sorts of things come only as far as i've seen them in harsh absolutes absolutes that take root in the center of even larger absolutes we are under the impression that we love sometimes because it is an emotional disorientation and the second we halt that spinning motion, the mysticism is mostly gone. And he, he says a, a bunch of interesting things about the dizzying heights of love and that sort of stuff. And then he talks about when that love ends and he says, despite the tired and late night discussions about having children and growing old in love, it never really happens, at least not with her. The terrifying part isn't the sudden end but how quickly you signed your life away to a woman you had only just met. It's scary and it's beautiful. But then, and this is the part where I I mean it when I say he's got a love-hate relationship with love and hate. He says, nothing bad comes of this, only more experience towards finding the one you never stop talking to. Not the case for women, though. They become disgusting sluts after too much of the process. Beware of the woman who's seen too frequently the spoils of war, romantic war. All romance is war. Love relies on tragedy always. <laughs> just, yeah. Just, just, is it incoherent or is it? <laughs> it's sometimes it's a it seems muddle to be, of strong emotions. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it seems to me that he's doing that thing that I think a lot of authors fall into this, where they'll say things that are just contradictory and think it sounds really deep, but in reality, they're just saying nothing. Yeah. He does it a fair bit. Sometimes he pulls it off. Sometimes it's a bit gimmicky. Just word salad. Yeah. And in that one, I think he almost uh, showed his hand a little bit too much. Mm. Like, with that and maybe a couple other sections of the book, he it's almost like he dropped the facade of this hyper character that he's mm. built up. Maybe that's why that I put it. Not only is he being incendiary, but this this protagonist is... is uh, a hyper Mike Ma. He's probably just picked out the most angsty yeah, angry parts yeah, of his own yeah, personality yeah. and he's just turned it up to 11 mm-hmm. and he's toned down everything else for the purpose of 
you know, as I said before, being incendiary, getting a rise out of people, you know, twisting the knife in to left lefty types. But he does. It's not. He doesn't keep it up all the time. Occasionally, he there's a little bit of human that shines <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that shines through. Out. Yeah, yeah. I just found this um this bit. It was after his whole bit when he's not sleeping for ages. He's using sleep deprivation as a drug. But <laughs> in the chapter, accelerate the world, decelerate your tribe. He gives a definition of how he sees acceleration. He says. Acceleration isn't just causing problems and watching the world contort in reaction. Acceleration is about causing problems the right way, the smart way, the kind of way that keeps you out of jail because you can't make forward, you can't move forward when you're chained down. Sorry, my handwriting is so bad. It's actually quite hard to read sometimes. <laughs> he then goes on to talk about energy drinks damaging your gut microbiome and how you should get energy from a good diet of black coffee instead. <laughs> Um, when when we're picking out these bits, oftentimes in a single chapter, he's not discussing one thing. No. He'll he'll mash together a few of his obsessions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting. Like that. And it's on the on the topic of drinking energy or not drinking energy drinks. He really hates alcohol. Yeah, he, he really really hates doesn't alcohol. like drinking. Which I don't uh, I don't drink, yeah. so I quite like that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's he's a good sort from that. that <laughs> Yeah, he has an interest, and he he smokes, so he doesn't like. Oh, dr- that's right. He yeah. doesn't like drugs, and he doesn't like alcohol, and I think partially, partially, or he either doesn't like it because of the health, which I think mm. is true, but also he gets a rise out of yeah. being the person at the party who doesn't drink, yeah, and the discomfort that that can, the social awkwardness that that can cause. Mm. Uh, but then he likes smoking, and he likes smoking because it's like cool, makes you look it, good, it makes you look cool. I think he said he said he said something. Not I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, he yeah. said he said not everyone who smokes is handsome, but all handsome people smoke. smoke. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was something like that. Yeah, mommy fucking comment <laughs> at, at a party. So. With regards to his connection to Bronze Age pervert, there, there was this one little part where he talks, of, and, and presumably Julius Evola, <laughs> he says, Atlantis and her people are still alive, uninterrupt, uninterrupted by mm. modernity. You won't find them because they don't want to be found. The ocean might always protect her. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Atlantis sank because they were doing... They, they, they committed the sin of miscegenation and performed titanic black magic, <laughs> at least of the second book of Julius Evola's Revolt Against the Modern World, who's anything to go by. We probably should re-record that episode sometime. Yeah, we Because at we the will. moment, it's just... I cut out all of the bits of me speaking <laughs> <laughs> and stitched them together. Oh, yeah, this is the quote from before what we were talking about with regards yeah. to good-looking criminals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The best part of that entire chapter, he said, the difference between good and bad criminals depends on how well they dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Oh, wait. So here's, here's him talking about alcohol in the chapter <laughs> Bar and Grill on Main Street. I don't drink alcohol. I think it's on par with owning a cable subscription, playing excessive video games, and smoking weed in terms of being a trampled on doofus. <laughs> to an extent, yeah, I'm sure, like you were saying, that's to get a rise out of people. But given his other preoccupations, I th- it wouldn't surprise me if Mike Ma in real life also didn't drink or drank very little. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and if, if that's the case, good on him. That's, not, that's a good lifestyle decision. Yeah, it's fine. I wonder if he takes Dexies. Probably this not. this has some real dexed out energy. Yeah, it has to a lot it. Of it Dex- wouldn't surprise me. Dexy vibes to it. Just smash smash a few Dexies. Stay up all night writing until he uh, gets. You know, there's an interesting state that you can get into when it's really late at night. Either you have or haven't been using Dexies to stay up, but for whatever reason, you're up at like two a.m. and you're still doing work. And if you get it just right, you can get in this weird sort of zone where you're still lucid and you're still doing stuff. And yes, you're incompetent or incapacitated, but because you're in this weird headspace where you want to go to sleep, you can start doing interesting work, you know, like start writing sentences that might be more interesting than you Mm. usually write. And you do have to come back, proofread it, check it and stuff, but 
I th- I have a feeling that a lot of this book was written in those sorts yeah. of states. I I've never experienced that because I because <laughs> Dexies bed, bed do not. Time. Yeah, but they they just don't agree with but, me. But even even if you just had a coffee and stayed up late doing it, I yeah. think you probably get into the state of the same thing. state of mind. It's more like uh, the sleep mm. sleep deprivation. Yeah, well he's he's got talky. he's got several chapters about depriving himself of sleep and yeah. hallucinating. Yeah. Eating thumbtacks and pulling them out of his insides and things yeah, like that. Yeah, there's a lot of hallucinations in the book. He's got this bit in a chapter called A Warmer Alan Hurst, <laughs> where I feel like you might get a peek into maybe what Mike Meyer is like. This, this was a, a sincere chapter, or at least parts of it were. He says, Of all the terrible things I have seen, the worst was to watch the spirits of old friends crushed under the weight of the lower world. He goes on to mm. say, mm. Nobody skateboards to the beach anymore. Nobody has basement parties, hoping their parents don't come home early anymore. Nobody wrestles on the lawn or skips stones on the lake anymore. Everyone works until it's time to sleep, and the time in between is spent tired. That, that's nice. I Well, not nice. Describing something extremely sad that I see. But, yeah. That's, yeah. That, that was nice, because that's something real that he's... Something real and sincere that he's he's touching on. Yeah, that's not him trying that's to get a rise out of someone no. or wrapped in irony. That's 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 an actual cultural that's real. critique. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I would say for a lot of people, they do live like that, and mm. it, is, it is sad. <laughs> Completely unrelated. No, I just flicked to this one that I liked. In I am the singer. Never consume dairy that isn't raw. The government made it illegal everywhere because they know it has the bacteria to kill depression. <laughs> yeah, so he, it's like punctuated by the occasional conspiratorial <laughs> fucking thing. Oh, oh, oh. Like, what? What? Oh. So the name of the chapter is either you stop eating or you stay fat. The quote is, "I'm the aesthete and the ethicist. I'm the alpha and the omega. I am war and peace. I'm yin and yang. I'm calling girls fat on the internet." <laughs> <laughs> it's just that it's just this. Absurdist schoolboy humour that yeah yeah, yeah. I mean maybe it's because I'm I'm, an, I'm a twelve year old absurdist schoolboy at heart yes. yeah yeah but <laughs> it's just funny yeah. <laughs> he has this other bit I'm not gonna find the quote yeah yeah, yeah. by the way he talks about somebody a girl posting about her boyfriend having died on her Facebook feed and he and everybody he's oh, like oh yeah yeah, yeah. The guy was actually a piece of shit <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he he like sold heroin to high schoolers or something yeah yeah. So this guy sold heroin to high schoolers and everybody on this Facebook post was saying, oh, so sorry to hear about your loss. He was such a good person. And he just writes, good riddance. And everybody blows up at him. And mm-hmm. then he goes off on a tirade about, yeah, I can't wait until his girlfriend dies as well that I can post the same thing on her face. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a troll. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not he actually said that is beside the point. It's the fact that he finds that amusing and, and it, it really just reminds me of like when me and my friends in high school, fifteen or sixteen, would just be intentionally offensive just to yeah. just to fuck with people on the internet. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's e- even even rude Facebook comments. If anyone uses Facebook anymore, even those contribute to acceleration. That's where the yeah, name of the do. book comes from. Yeah. It's he's got this quote in the the chapter hidden in the branches. It's today that you have accepted that you yourself are an engine of chaos, an accelerationist. You architect harassment. (laughs) 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 I don't have any more quotes to read. Yeah, we've we've read enough quotes to give people an idea of what it's like to read harassment architecture. Really, harassment architecture is the, the quotes that we read out for 150 pages. Yeah. That's yeah. That that's it. That's it. That's the book. Yeah. Your how much you enjoyed those quotes will determine whether you should read harassment architecture or not. If you found any of what we just said offensive, then please don't read the book. No, read it. <laughs> or read it. Yeah. Read it. Or, or maybe you're exactly Definitely the, the person it. that that, that, that Mike Ma want, wants to read just so that you fucking kill over from having a heart attack. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Having such high blood pressure from all the offensive shit in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's going out. I think that he... I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the stuff he... Like, even the racism. I wouldn't be surprised if he's racist and homophobic to some degree. But I think he's he's turned that up to the point in order to 
be intentionally offensive. Yeah. It's yeah. a piece of art. At the end of the day, this is... I would interpret this as art. And the reason why, you know, other, other than the fact that we're making a podcast episode about about the book. So just, mm. just so that people know who are listening, I'm not white. <laughs> I'm, I'm mixed race. So every time we come across a Bronze Age pervert type who's <laughs> racist and or doesn't like race mixing, like Euless Evola and stuff, you know, it's not necessarily... <laughs> the nicest for, for, <laughs> for me to read <laughs> but i'm doing it for the podcast but even even reading this having having said that like reading his racism i'm interpreting it through the lens of well this is art mm. and i can disagree with it but i don't think that it's worthwhile say i wouldn't for example be pro censorship i don't think that this sort of thing should be you know, forcibly removed from mm. wherever. Whereas I think a lot of other people would look at this book and be like, no, this should not be allowed to be sold. You shouldn't distribute mm. it. <laughs> yeah. What What were your thoughts on doing a fiction book? I, well, I like fiction anyway, so yeah. I quite enjoyed reading fiction. Just so listeners in our audience know, Jack is currently writing fiction books. And he's quite a good writer. Thank You're on you. your second book. Yep. Yep. Hopefully he'll be publishing them soon. Um, at the time of releasing this episode, it'll be June 2022. He hasn't published anything yet, either self-published or um, through normie uh, publishing. publishing. Normie, normie publishing. But, I mean, you could follow in Mike Mars' footsteps mm. and self-publish. Is this self-published? I'm pretty sure this is self-published. Yeah. So, I mean, with enough of an audience, you could. Anyways, hopefully one day our audience gets to read something published by Jack because he's a very good writer. Um <laughs> He's better than Mike Ma. <laughs> Much better. But it uh, was it was so if Mike Ma can make a few sales. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. it was nice reading fiction for this. Interesting reading a book of fiction that is so obviously linked to a non-fiction book that we've done in Bronze Age mindset. There there are just too many shared ideas between the two. He probably, They're probably thanks him in, in the acknowledgments. At the very least, I'm sure Mike Myers has read Bronze Age Mindset. Oh, 100%. Maybe even listened to some Caribbean Rhythms. With <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, for all we know, he might be a guest on Caribbean Rhythms. Maybe That's what I, I would wouldn't be listen, surprised. I would listen to that. I'd listen to that. It would be a weird conversation, wouldn't it? I, it would, I would, or maybe they're just rehashing yeah. all the things that they believe anyway, so maybe it'd be really boring. I'm not sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. it's, <laughs> but it was interesting reading that, and we've we've talked about this already, how... It's interesting trying to separate Mike Ma as the author from the unnamed protagonist of harassment architecture to what extent that protagonist is reflective of Mike Ma in real life. Hard to say. Very hard to say. He is a troll. Yeah, he's definitely a troll. I watched a bunch of his videos and like there, there, there were ones where he was saying an anti-Trump rally. Mm. Really, yeah, just yeah, seriously yeah. talking about how yeah, yeah. they should execute Trump and kill him and things like that, and laughing. So that was actually kind of funny. <laughs> that, was, that was quite funny. The first video on his on his, on his YouTube channel is uh, somebody asked him about like what we should do. It's like it's tiny little clips, like twenty seconds. The they're, they're like, oh yeah, what should we do about all these problems or something with the world? And he's like, accelerate it. Like, yeah, <laughs> keep on like, push it further. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. At some conference or I'm sure there are ideas in this book that are just reflective of what he actually believes. So I wanted to probably ask you- some of these he is playing up. Oh yeah, definitely. He's a, but- he's definitely heightening things, <laughs> which is fine. Like that's a that's a form of comedy. Yeah, but but it, it, it satire. Yeah, but also it social it made a book of fiction that I enjoyed. Like that. There are aspects of it that I don't like. I prefer there to be a plot, but I, I did enjoy this. So, yeah, you know, him playing it up has made something that I don't feel like I wasted my time reading, which is not something I can say for most things we've read on this. This is like a, an inside look of uh, all the people that, like, the New York Times thinks 4chan is. Oh, no, this guy's literate. It's lit. Yeah, no, this yeah. guy is literate. I'm not sure most people. No, are no, no. I mean, I mean, in terms of like, uh, like, oh yeah, there. Oh, you mean yeah, in terms like, of his beliefs? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is the F O R Chan's view of the world. F O R. What's F O R? 
I think there was some news. There's some news clip where they're talking about the hacker 4chan. F O R C H A N. Oh, yeah. Right. This is probably what they think that everybody who's on 4chan yeah. is yeah, like. That's, that's all I meant. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I did want to ask you a question now that we've read this book and we've discussed it, is this, how much is this satire? How much is this actual Mike Ma and to what, you know, Mike Ma's a, a troll? What do you think the role of the trolls is in society? I'm not sure. What. What is the role? As in, are they serving a function? Are they serving or? a function? And if so, is it a useful function? Is it a good function? Where Where is it good and bad? I think there is something of a moral panic mm. at the moment mm. in that peop- you, you have certain people who are just searching for any evidence of an ism or a phobia yeah. in other people. Yeah. And it's it's getting to the point where it's almost it's almost religious. Almost. <laughs> like say it is true. It it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. It's quite interesting. There are certain words that now you're not allowed to say in any context, depending on who you are. Yeah. And your intention doesn't matter. It's mm. the word itself yeah. is imbued with power. And that to me is an almost magical thinking. It's almost it superstitious. It's it's certainly Irris- Orwellian. Ir- irrespective of what the person's saying yeah. it, is using the word for, whether they're saying it to insult someone and degrade someone or to illustrate a point, either way, or making, they're quoting, yeah, making yeah. that noise yeah. carries with it power and something that should be disallowed. Yes. So if I'm, if I'm going to be charitable, I would say in that area, trolls are acting against this mm. religious moral panic. Mm. And so I think there there is a role in that of pushing mm. back. Mm. Trolls say piling in on someone on social media, I don't know, making fun of someone who died just to piss people off. I think that's just that's just cruel. Just, just what what is the role trash. of trolls? It really it's context dependent. It's very very. Like, what what are they doing? But it'd be fair to say, or I I think it, it's fair to say that we shouldn't ban them outright we shouldn't sorry cleanse the internet <laughs> you know uh who was i think clinton hillary clinton or maybe just the de- democrats this this the safety saying, brigade like, in general the safety brigade brigade are saying like we need to take down f- sites like 4chan and reddit needs to clamp down on their uh like censoring and uh whatever they call like community Con- content, content moderation. moderation like this safety brigade is clamping down, and I think, even though I don't spend any time on 4chan, and I don't generally like it, I think having places on the internet where there is an extremely wide... Like, 4chan, Mm. I believe their only rule is no child porn. So, they might have other rules, but at least that's, like, one of the core rules. And that's about as broad as you can get. And I think ha- having parts of the internet, maybe it doesn't have to be Reddit, uh, but we certainly shouldn't go out on witch hunts and try and shut down all the chans mm. or all the other parts. I think uh, we don't want to live in that sort of society where a small group of people can wield that sort of power to shut down conversation that they don't like. Yeah, well, it's it's just this epistemic certainty yeah. as well. So, uh, yeah. If, if the question is, should trolls be allowed, then... Yes, I believe in free speech. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the epistemic certainty. So the, the certainty that peop- the, the safety brigade, members of the safety brigade, know what the truth is and know what the correct thing to say and what yes. not to say is. And the correct thing to believe. Is so short-sighted. It, people tend to get very excited about censorship when they're censoring other people. Yeah. When their opinions, yeah. which are... Yes. Of it's manifestly obvious the right <laughs> yeah, yeah, opinions yeah. are not getting censored. <laughs> yeah. It's like how a lot of people love authoritarianism when the authoritarian is their guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not or, so it's not so they play that, someone you don't agree with. Or they play the game, the the dictator game. Mm. They're like, what would you do if you were the dictator of yeah. the country? <laughs> and it's That's like right. I I don't want to be the yeah, dictator yeah. of the country. <laughs> like, you're thinking about this the wrong way, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, you. I think that's super important. I think I, it's it's really important. For, I think it's incredibly important. I think the troll is super, super important. 
I think it's important for people to have a place in their lives where they can be a bad person. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I think it's re and there is anonymous sort of puritanical anonymous places uh, can serve of morals that function. I think it's super important. I also think it's super important. So two things. One quick thing is, I think the uh, so the first point is trolls when they're doing things that are attacking sacred cows, especially irrational sacred cows in like using absurdism or humor or whatever, or if it's uh, attacking say a power structure, I think can play a really important role. A good example of this is like Xi Jinping uh, being made into Pooh Bear. Mm -hmm. I think that sort of trolling, it's a shame that it got snuffed down, snuffed out, so harshly they fucking China. banned Winnie yeah. the Pooh yeah and I'm sure you'd s- face serious consequences if you were caught in China mm. publishing that sort of stuff about Xi Jinping but that's exactly the point like that's China is not the sort of society that we want to emulate we don't want to go down mm. that route oh the safety brigade always bring up oh but they're so efficient Th- uh, yeah, they're yeah. very. The World I mean, World Economic Forum Safety Brigade. They're, they're extremely efficient at locking up tens of millions of people in their yeah. apartment and starving. Ethnic them. cleansing and, 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 and uh, gain gain of function mutations. They're they're extremely <laughs> fucking efficient and yeah, and sending people off death camps and stuff. Yeah, so they I I don't think they're the sort of country that we mm. should be emulating. They're a closed society, and we we should be an open society. And being an open society means tolerating people that you don't like and opinions that you disagree with. Mm-hmm. And I think that the troll one of the important things that they're doing is they're sniping powerful people, powerful institutions. Like, for example, GameStop. (laughs) Like, whether or not not that worked out in their favour or whatever is kind of beside the point because what they did is they just just shook Wall Street a bit. So, like, when they take down, they make memes about whatever powerful politician. I think that's good because uh, it's almost like false idolatry. Mm-hmm. Like, whether it's Trump or Biden or Clinton or, like, leaders in Australia or elsewhere or celebrities or whatever. Like, they're just people. And the way that we idolize leaders and celebrities is a form of false idolatry. And having a small part of the internet that is just pumping out memes and taking these people down level, I think, is actually healthy for society. Mm -hmm. A a certain level of that, in my opinion. It's an immune system. (laughs) It's an immune system. Yeah, that's a good... It's a cultural... It's a memeological immune system. It's not always light. It's not always nice. It's not... No, it's not nice. I'm not saying that it's enjoyable yeah. necessarily. Like, but then again, like... Like the immune system though. When you when your body's making interferon, it feels bad, but you really need it to fight off infection. Yeah, you want to... Like, if you've got a temperature when you're sick, that's your body doing the right thing. Yeah. If you were sick and don't <laughs> have a temperature... <laughs> that then, temperature... Then you're in trouble. temperature is the Mike Mars of the world. That's the Mike, the Mike Mars part of the immune system. They're like a... Although Mike Mars might be uh, when does the immune system get out of control and it just becomes like autoimmune <laughs> hmm. this is an intro the other important thing about it i think is that opening up the overton window the overton window is like the the space of acceptable dialogue within a culture uh and or a society and i think that each media organized i don't know if it's coordinated or it's cohesive mm. but certainly like individual people but also institutions whether it's media institutions or political parties like want to control the overton window mm. and i think having at least some part of society that is always like no we reject that overton window is, yeah. is also a good thing yeah 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 final thoughts i guess we've been giving our final thoughts i i i, I don't think anyway I don't think I would like Mike Ma as a person. <laughs> I don't. I, maybe. I mean, he might be an interesting person to talk to. He probably has just a very radically different perspective on the world to me. But I appreciate the book, despite all the misogyny and the hatred and the homophobia and stuff. I, I appreciate it because it speaks to the 15-year-old internet troll in me. Yeah, Who likes yes. to sort of stay stuff on the internet just to get a rise out of people. And it also, I also like the role that it plays with regards to keeping a healthy check on the egos and the megalomaniacal safety brigade that is trying to 
control everybody's thoughts and speech. Yeah, I, do, I reflexively like things if I know the safety brigade wouldn't like it. Yes. Which is not healthy. Like, that's not a good... That's <laughs> not just, a good heuristic. It's just a reactionary. Yeah. I, 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 I think the safety brigade are deeply reactionary themselves. Yeah, they, they are. I, I acknowledge that's a bad heuristic. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just... It's, it's a knee-jerk reaction. It's an emotional reaction. It's a very yeah. emotional reaction. <laughs> yeah. From an aesthetic perspective, I like how this book was written. I think he writes well. Yeah. And I think he's... He's probably at his funniest when he's not trying to be a 15-year-old edgelord. <laughs> yeah, edgelord, that's right. He's an edgelord. It's, it's he's just a, a, he's a complete edgelord. This is just a tomb of edgelording. <laughs> but he, he's, he's a funny guy. He's funny, yeah. I would read his second I, book, would you? Yeah, that's probably... It, Should like, we I put it on the roadmap? Our, our rate, yeah, why not? It's yeah. our, our rating system's fucking bullshit. I don't know if I can continue okay, with why don't, ratings. But why don't my, we ditch the rating system? My, my rating for this right, book is, <laughs> is I would read Gothic Violence, his second book. Independently of the podcast, as you said. Yeah. Yeah, so that's as the highest rate. Is it the best book you've read so far in this for this podcast? Uh, on it what dep- you depends on how you define best. So, say Unabomber Manifesto made me think a lot more than this did. This didn't make me think. And it was also really culturally important. Yeah. This was... The Unabomber Manifesto was well-written as well. Yeah. Well-written in a very different way, but... Something I did no editing. Yeah. I would say this is probably the most enjoyable thing I've written. Read. Read. Yeah, yeah, I didn't write it. It's yeah. the most, most enjoyable thing I've written. Jack is Mike Mike. I am Mike Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is the most enjoyable thing I've read from this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. This... Yeah, he had to grit your teeth in parts of it when he was like, oh, okay, you're talking about women again. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I get it. He is it's, just... You've, you've made this and, point. And a number of times in the book, he just says, yeah, I I was thinking about something and then I realized I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he acknowledges that he's a piece of shit, or at least the narrator. The hyper character. The hyper character who is presumably the distillation of the worst parts of Mike Mars <laughs> <laughs> acknowledges that he's just a piece of shit. So... Yeah, it's it's a fun read. Compared to our last book, Practical Female Psychology, which was boring that and was, awful. It was just... This was a lovely, refreshing book that yeah. was actually interesting, engaging, funny, mm-hmm. well-written. Given, um, given that it has no plot, it is longer than it needs to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've never really read that. I Have I? Maybe when I was younger, I read a little bit. But I've not read... That much stream of consciousness the stuff. Internet so. edgelord fiction is not a genre you've no, <laughs> you've been part of in any no. major way. Um, so that's our final thoughts. What Her- about what? What are we? What are what are we going to read next? What do you reckon? We're going to read. So on my Prometheus Rising, we're going to read Prometheus Rising. Yeah, that's it. So a preview of a uh, rough preview of Prometheus Rising is. Wacky psycho linguistic stuff, breathing exercises to elevate your soul, something something circuitry of the mind. Mm. Jack and I are gonna do some woo woo shit. Well, well, <laughs> Prometheus, right? Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's on the roadmap that I want to put on the roadmap. Another thing I found when I was looking on lit for for book ideas: Call of the Crocodile. <laughs> what? What's that about? By I think their name's Gardner or something. It's a meme book that is a horror story about a crocodile eating someone or something like that nice. meant to be almost unreadable great uh, let's give it a, <laughs> we'll give it, it, a give it a shot go. so before we wrap up we should do our first ever audience shout out <laughs> <laughs> we are actually starting to get some listeners aren't we jack yeah which is weird and interesting to think that there's a small number of people out there yes. presumably because <clears throat> Because the number of viewers is growing, presumably some of them have listened before. They're not all new viewers, mm. I assume. <laughs> Which means that it's really lovely. Anybody who has, if this is not your first episode, thank you for listening to multiple episodes. And if you're new here, thank you for listening to the, for the first time. Mm. But shout out to Leshy shout on out YouTube. To Leshy. Yeah, on YouTube. First comment Our first ever, ever comment. Yeah. Is uh, <laughs> what do you say? Oh yeah, he said you guys should read Julius Evola. <laughs> book nerds like uh, he said something along the, line, along the lines of yeah, book nerds struggle when they read Evola, and boy did we! I fucking think struggle. everyone struggles when they read Evola. <laughs> so shout out to Leshy, thanks for the comment. 
if you want to contact us, we have a Twitter at Book Club Hell 666. We also have a Discord, which we'll be attending to. Mm. <laughs> and shout out to Texas. Tons of, tons of Texans <laughs> are listening to our yeah. podcast. Yeah. Oh, if you definitely, if you're from Texas, hit us up because we both want to go to Texas. <laughs> 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 and so go onto Twitter, follow us on Twitter, uh, and you can contact us directly either through Twitter or through our Discord. The link to our Discord is in our Twitter bio. So you can just click on that, join us, and you can... Talk to us directly, and if, of course, if you have any suggestions about weird books we should read, we'd love to hear from you. I didn't even know we had a Discord. Yeah, we do have a Discord. It's on, it's, on, it's on our Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on, it's on. I will be responding. I'll make sure that Jack, Jack's on the Discord as well. <laughs> um, other than that, anything else? That's all. All right, great. Thanks well, for thank listening. You. Thank you for listening. See you next time. <laughs>